Okay, so I'd like to introduce the speaker for our second session, who is Dr. Costas Canaris. He's a paediatric intensive care and retrieval medicine consultant from Manchester and um, Stoke, and does a lot of the retrieval and transport with um, the Northwest Transport Service. So over to you, Costas, who's going to talk to us about APLS Plus and preparing for the paediatric critical care team to arrive. Thanks, Kerry. Um, hi, everyone. Um, thanks for uh, having me over tonight. Um, so, uh, like Kerry said, I'm an intensivist, a paediatric intensivist. I work at NEWTS, which is the Northwest and North, North Wales Transport Service, and uh, I also work at uh, University Hospital North Midlands, which is over at uh, Stokeway. Uh, and today I'm going to teach you um, a bit more about um, uh, APLS uh, and more about preparing for the critical care retrieval team um, to come uh, to your DGH or wherever it is that you work. Um, and to do that, I'm going to use a real case we've had at Newts a few years back. I have full consent from the family to do so. Um, and the way the uh, webinar will work is uh, it's completely interactive um, so you can make uh, it as good as you guys want by uh, asking questions by playing along in the poll um, and as we're going to uh, come up with a management plan together in, in an a b c d e fashion um, i rely on you to uh, ask questions and make the plan for each step of the way so don't be shy uh, and get your phones so you can play along with uh, with the polling system um, and um, I'll now present the patient. So uh, this is Chloe. Um, Chloe was um, taken by her mother to her GP. Uh, she's six years um, of age and she had a past medical history of febrile convulsions. Uh, the GP visit was for a sore throat, which started a couple of days ago. Um, she saw the GP and on her way out had a seizure outside the practice. They were actually on the way to get some oral antibiotics um, from the pharmacy, but she hadn't actually had any. She, during the seizure, she knocked her head on the pavement um, and the paramedics when there they stabilized her, uh, they gave some buccal uh, mitas, a couple of uh, doses of, um, of IV benzodiazepines and they were on the way to the um, A&E department. Uh, she was in A&E uh, fitting for a further 40 minutes and she had already been loaded with phenytoin and the DGH called Newt to let them know that they're about to intubate this child. They had some OBS and some numbers for us. So I will leave the OBS and the gas there for you. So you can um, work through them in your head and point out what is wrong. So from the first instance, she's clearly tachycardic. Blood, pre blood pressure is, uh, if accurate, is, in the, in, is worrying for a child of uh, six years of age. She's needing a, a lot of oxygen to not saturate very well. She's pyrexial, perfusion could be better. She's already got sluggish pupils and she's fitting. And she's got a pretty awful looking gas. So if you uh, could all type down, or some of you type down what uh, worries you the most about that gas and those obs, and then Kerry can um, tell me what uh, everyone thinks. Are we getting anything, Kerry? We've got a couple of comments. So we've got some scary sats, low saturations, despite oxygen, and um, the pH is abnormal. 
<laughs> temperature is very high. This comment is cooking the brain. Um, there's some CO2 retention and some severe acidosis with low calcium and some hypotension as well. Uh, pure oxygenation and a few comments saying mixed acidosis. Um, there's a couple commenting on severe metabolic acidosis and respiratory acidosis though as well. Good. So um, do any of the uh, participants um, think that this is in keeping with the band door um, febrile convulsion in a child? So she's six, so she's at the tail end of when febrile fits to happen. So the age would be in keeping with someone with febrile fits. So is the gas in itself and the rest of the ops in keeping with someone who's just had a febrile convulsion? So the consensus is strongly no. Okay, so brilliant. I'm glad to hear that. So, <laughs> so she um, ticks lots of the boxes for um, for uh, sepsis, and therefore, yes, the sepsis may have unmasked uh, and caused a seizure, but sepsis is by far uh, the most important pathology here, and we need to treat it as such. So, we need to. Uh, learn to scrutinize numbers and gases when they don't fit what we're used to uh, and the gas gives you lots of clues here um, as do the obs so a child who's got a febrile convulsion would not be accept expected to have had such a high oxygen demand with such poor sats the blood pressure has already gone um, and we have a severe mixed acidosis whereas in a bound or febrile convulsion or status epileptic as usually you get um, mostly a pure respiratory acidosis. So you may get a lactate rise in a uh, in status, but a lactate of 5.2, we need to err on the side of caution and, and assume that there's more mischief than we anticipate. So let's go to the next slide. There we go. So together we will formulate an airway plan. So if you've got your sheets of paper, I'll give you a minute to try and scribble a quick plan and then using the polling system we will break it down together in an a b c d e f g fashion all right people are answering already so you can all join at slido.com and that's the code you need to get in i'll give uh, people a minute to uh, make up their minds and i'm not going to give away the answer till um, i finish talking about a so if you have any questions about a you can ask them at the end of me doing a and uh, that's how hopefully it's going to work. Have we got any uh, questions already, uh, Kerry? There's some discussion in the chat regarding um, whether to intubate or whether to not intubate yet and um, cover with some fluid or try and manage the blood pressure prior to intubation. Um, so there's a few comments along those lines. Okay. And a lot of comments regarding um, what you've just said really, um, preempting that this seems to be a very sick child um, that it's not just a fit and that there seems to be something else behind it. Great, great, okay. Bye, bye. Uh, and so let's start with the tube first. So the, the best way, the, the longer we practice medicine, um, the, the more we uh, learn pattern recognition. So as an intensivist, I'm very comfortable in my bubble of very sick children um, and um, trying to beat the illness by uh, trying to preempt how it's going to behave. So uh, the as per APLS guidelines, this child has already had phenytoin and is still fitting um, and it will therefore be appropriate to intubate. Uh, uh, fluid resuscitation is appropriate and she could have had it before, um, but doesn't stop us giving her fluid beforehand but she's still fitting. So she needs to be intubated for that reason. Uh, there are other things we 
uh, could have given prior to Fanny Tewin, uh, and um, I would personally prefer Capra over Fanny Tewin, um because it's not inferior to Fanny Tewin as uh, as per the Eclipse trial uh, that was done back in, published back in November, um, and it's. It causes less cardiac arrhythmias and it doesn't have to be given over 20 minutes. So for someone who's impatient like myself, you can just bolus it and have faster results. But it doesn't matter ultimately whether you give phenytoin or, or Keppra. So, uh, but phenytoin had already been given by the time we were referred Chloe. Um, so that's, that's one point. So we can put the those who the naysayers of the intubation to bed with that um so i'm seeing lots of mixed um mixed reactions uh so so far ketamine rock and cuff tube habit uh thion sucks is uh second um also with a cuff tube so let's start with the tube so she's septic um so in children with sepsis um, we anticipate um, a lot of uh, mischief uh, with ventilation. So they, we know, we know they become coagulopathic. We know they have capillary leak, and 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 they're prone to both getting pulmonary edema and, and possibly a, a, a pulmonary bleed. Um, and these children need very high pressures because there's a lot of resistance to them being ventilated uh, adequately. The best way to ventilate them is to have a cuff tube uh, and the best thing to do for Chloe is not to expose her to the risks of needing reintubation by putting an uncuffed tube whereby the seal is not as good and therefore would not allow us to ventilate her um, adequately. Uh, so therefore she definitely needs a cuff tube as the first tube. Okay, now Lots of you have gone for thiopentone and saxamethonium. Um, so current APLS guidelines um, still say that we should intubate with thiopentone. But remember that uh, they were written for the barn door status epilepticus. And this is much more than that. Uh, this is a child who's septic. So before we reach for a drug, we need to know what the side effects are. And thiopentone is a potent vasodilator and there have been a number of um, high level incidents both in adults and children where status epilepticus with severe sepsis has not been recognized as such uh, leading to, um, uh, to adverse outcomes during intubation. So we need to step away from thiopentone and think of a less cardio unstable uh, induction cocktail so to speak okay uh, so if the child is profoundly septic we need to um, step away from thiopentone and give something else and unfortunately this is not highlighted in APLS um, but we're trying to get it changed as an addendum to make sure that people don't label every fitting child the same um, which then brings us to saxomethonium so can the Participants tell me what a common side effect of the paralyzing agent saxomethonium is. Let me see what Kerry says. So we've got quite a few going for raised potassium. Good. Okay. So if we went back to my first slide with the gas, this child already has. Uh, a high high normal potassium was 5.2 or something like that so again with first do no harm principle this child we know uh, we suspect strongly that a septic she's been fitting so she's got a combination of probable rhabdomyolysis and a degree of renal hypoperfusion causing acute kidney injury so she's not able to clear her potassium so by giving something extra that might push intracellular potassium to, extracell to the extracellular space causing a hyperkalemia is probably not the best idea. So the least cardion stable cocktail to use, which is my, our mantra in most 
critical care retrieval teams is ketamine, one milligram per kilo, fentanyl, one, uh, one microgram per kilo, and rocuronium, one milligram per kilo. So that's easy to remember. It's one, one, one. Uh, as long as you don't mix up your milligrams with micrograms, that's almost uh, foolproof. Now, she's already hypotensive, severely tachycardic, uh, with a plug, uh, with a, uh, and still fitting. Um, so we need to prepare for failure. We need to preempt what might happen even when we give her that cardio stable cocktail. Um, and what gets us out of a hole often is having uh, peripheral anotropes running. Um, there's lots of different uh, preferences in the literature about what the best anotrope is. Uh, we'll touch that up, uh, upon that on in the C part. Um, but uh, as, as long as you've got an anotrope running peripherally, usually um, most DGHs tend to go with dopamine. Adrenaline is the one recommended by um, by the recent literature and the recent consensus, uh, then it gives you a bit more reserve uh, to not arrest during induction. Um, make sure you have lots of fluid drawn up to, to bolus it um, in case she, there's hypotension during, the, the, during induction of anesthesia and the intubation. Uh, and make sure to have some dilute adrenaline to bolus. So, um, so what I mean by dilute adrenaline is uh, essentially a tenfold dilution of the rhesus dose of adrenaline. So we take the rhesus dose of adrenaline, make it up in a 10 ml syringe, so dilute it tenfold, and if we see the heart rate dropping, we see the blood pressure dropping during the intubation process, then we make sure the um, person in charge of the drugs um, knows that they can give one ml of that cocktail with a flush uh, to try and bring the heart rate and the blood pressure up. Uh, a lot of the pediatric trainees are used to atropine. Um, again, I don't tend to use atropine because in this situation, um, atropine um, just affects the heart rate, does not affect the cardiac, co cardiac contractility. So we need something to be used as an inotrope as well to prevent uh, cardiac arrest and also um, atropine also blunts our uh, monitoring skills because it causes um, uh, papillary dilatation so if we need to monitor her neurology during transport I'm not going to be sure whether dilated pupils are because of atropine or because of the patient's pathology. Um, and um, yeah, have a low threshold for sticking IOs in, obviously. So uh, you can run central strength iron tropes through an IO. Uh, any questions so far? Um, there's, a, there's a comment in terms of um, the difficult dynamics sometimes um, between being a general paediatrician um, and obviously an anaesthetic team who are often in district generals and outside of a PICU, NICU setting, more often in charge of um, actually intubating the child. And um, is it easy to do what is most comfortable for, for them and how involved we should be as a general paediatrician? Um, what I would say is, um, I don't want to give the game away with uh, what happened with Chloe in the end, but um, um, uh, the teams need to do what the, the the most safe anesthetic is the one the team is comfortable with so i try not to micromanage over the phone while i get there but i also need to signpost red flags uh and uh, and big no-no so for me the biggest no-no in this would be um using thio and sucks um certainly at the le at the doses that uh, apls recommend and everything else is down to um the comfort zone um but you know it takes an army to say to to have a good outcome for this kid so uh, we're not there to micromanage we're there to advise and mobilize quickly if we're not already out with another child uh and and and, and come and help in our in, in our own way so uh 
I understand we're more comfortable with looking after these kids, but we, when we don't tell teams what to do, certainly I don't, uh, but we can advise about certain um, uh, management plans that could be optimized. So using thio in this patient would uh, not be a good plan, uh, uh, nor using propofol for induction in this case either, because it has a similar effect. And then there's a, there's a comment, Costas, just about um, using muscle relaxants in fitting children. Um, and is there any um, kind of concerns or tips or tricks that you would have um, in terms of monitoring whether they're still clinically fitting um, and how to, how to keep an eye on that situation? Uh, well, if you're about to intubate, um, certainly sucks have a very, has a very short um, half life. Um, rock will last a bit longer, but certainly if you've given one milligram per kilo, it will wear off within uh, with less than an hour. Um, um, which, you know, if you're planning to scan your fitting children or not, it's very rare that children that get intubated for pure status get extubated within the hour. Uh, so it's imperative that we use um, a paralyzing agent, not least to make risks of the intubation process uh, less because if you have vocal cords that are not fully paralyzed then you are more likely than to have failure of intubation um, which will then take you down a different more dangerous rabbit hole so uh, I almost never intubate without um, using a paralyzing agent and almost always with the Okay, so I think in the interest of time, unless there's a very important question, I'll move on. So what is our breathing plan for this child? Uh, so remember what I told you about how we think uh, sepsis will manifest uh, in the lungs, how it will behave. So just to make a comment for the recording, there's 145 participants at the moment, um, just so that you can see what percentage of people are voting in the polls. Okay, so lots of thoughts and ongoing changes. Um, fab. Okay, so um, like I said, these lungs are likely to be flooded. She's going to need a lot of volume. She's got leaking capillaries. She's likely to get pulmonary edema, and indeed she had pulmonary edema and, uh, and a pulmonary bleed as well. So there were so a lot of blood um, coming out of the tube. Um, now. The, uh, the international consensus that came out in February this year, uh, which uh, the full link for the open access that we'll provide at the end of the session, uh, says we need to employ it. There's good evidence to suggest that a high PEEP strategy improves oxygenation. Um, the rationale for that is, uh, simplistically speaking, is that uh, if we imagine the alveolus as a, your normal party balloon, it is more difficult to the, the, to inflate that part, party balloon at the beginning of the of the inflation process, so when the balloon is completely flat, uh, and by high having a high peep, we're not allowing that balloon to collapse back on itself and and try and reopen it. So we're essentially stopping uh, uh, alveoli from becoming terminally atelectatic, and then using more shear forces to open them up. So we're minimizing 
uh, trauma to uh, ventilation into lung trauma, lung injury that way. And we're also improving oxygenation uh, uh, in that respect. Uh, similar goes with the eye time. So we try and have a slightly higher eye time because most um, uh, the most efficient oxygenation happens during the inspiratory phase. So the longer you keep the inspiratory phase up, the longer you, uh, you have the alveoli stented, the better tends to be the oxygenation. And oxygenation really needs to be our prime concern in this setting. Um, uh, and we can worry a bit less about hypercarbia because people die from <laughs> hypoxia, not from hypercarbia. So we can ride out uh, the hyper hypercarbia up to up to a point. Um, so we would tend to always start with a peep of 10 um, and titrate up to effect. Uh, and even with a peep of 10, Chloe had sats in the 60s. When she had a peep of 15, the sats were in the mid 70s. So she was very, very unwell. The fact that she had lots of blood coming up from the tube didn't help. Um, now, evidence in this sort of uh, situation is pretty limited. Um, the best available evidence we have is that adrenaline nebs, the croup dose, helps. Uh, physiologically, that's because it vasoconstricts. Um, and that can augment the bleeding from that point of view. Uh, but nebulized tramexam tranexamic acid is uh, increasingly being used. Uh, the evidence doesn't really come from septic children, it comes from uh, adults with hemoptysis, but also children with uh, post tonsillectomy uh, who, who have had an upper respiratory bleed. And the dosage is pretty straightforward, um, 250 milligrams uh, nebulized if you're under 25 kilos and um, 500 milligrams if you're over 25 kilos and I can provide the reference for that at the end but like I said it's pretty low uh, quality evidence but we use it nonetheless because we have very little else to uh, to offer. Uh, now this girl had a very high oxygenation index so very difficult to ventilate even on very high pressures she, like I said, she was ha having sat in the mid 70s. Uh, so, which begged the question of whether we should use nitric or not. Uh, most of you seem to have voted for nitric. Uh, now, we had a good chat about nitric uh, between us on the bedside, and we felt on balance because uh, the way nitric works is to drop pulmonary resistance and pulmonary pressures by vasodilating the. Pul um, pulmonary circulation, given that she was bleeding so much, uh, we thought vasodilation would make matters worse. So we steered well clear of nitric uh, on that principle. Um, whereas if she wasn't bleeding, we would have considered it. Any questions so far? No, nothing specific really. There's okay. There's a comment about tranexamic acid um, being used in neonates as treatment for hemoptysis, um, but nothing really specific. Great, okay. So we move on to circulation, the meaty stuff. Okay, let's see what you think. Okay, so keep voting or start talking. So, um, 
when people vote, I'll talk about uh, the hidden ionotrope. So calcium is the hidden ionotrope. So she's hypocalcemic. Calcium is um, an integral part of uh, ensuring myocardial contractility is adequate. And uh, if your ionized calcium, calcium is low, then uh, heart doesn't contract as well and ionotropes don't work very well. And it further adds to the coagulopathy that this patient had. So uh, we had to um, top up the calcium um, a few times um, and it's consumptive. So you, you need to give it and recheck it and carry on giving it until uh, uh, you, even if your ionized calcium is more than 1.1, 1.15, which is usually what we target, uh, we need to ensure that it stays as high as that. Um, and that ensures uh, what I've just said, not making the myocardium uh, work as optimally as you possibly can. Um, which then. Is there, is there a preferred method to correct the calcium um, between uh, calcium gluconate, calcium chloride? Um, the, well, there is so there's um, the, again the evidence specifically for children is limited, and since um, they only uh, there's four big randomized control trials, not big but randomized control trials, a mixture of adults and children, um, and essentially most use calcium gluconate, and that's fine because it can go through a peripheral line, uh, and because it's less concentrated. Uh, there's a, you decrease the chance of extravasation, uh, but there's a theory that because gluconate undergoes first pass metabolism in the liver, if you're fully septic, then you're uh, and, and hypoperfusing your liver, you're less likely to have an adequate effect of your ionized calcium um, when compared to chloride. Uh, the RCTs for children have shown chloride to be superior at correcting ionized calcium than gluconate because you don't need to undergo that first pass metabolism but it's a lot more um, toxic it can cause more tissue necrosis uh, if given peripherally so you should only really give it as a slow infusion through an IO or a central line and um, what my practice is I still give gluconate uh, and keep an eye on the ionized calcium and if it doesn't respond after two doses of gluconate then I bring out the big guns usually but it's based on just four papers there's not much more there to base our practice on. And uh, in particular target for calcium is there is there a certain level that empirically we say 1.15 ionized now it's important to not go off the lab glucose you need to go off the ionized calcium because that's the free calcium that is useful to you in that setting um, the lab calcium doesn't give you ionized doesn't give you free calcium and it's dependent on your albumin and all sorts of different factors plus it takes forever to get back uh, so in the context of a critically ill patient you need to go off the ionized then keep checking it uh, essentially now uh, which brings us then to shock and I'll just quickly revert back to the pie point if I can figure it out so Chloe was clearly in warm shock okay um, which uh, is accounts for about a third of the uh, shock children that we see um, and therefore for the purists the best inotropes of choice would be uh, noradrenaline first which can also be given peripherally um, um, and then vasopressin now like i said there's big variation in practice and we do not micromanage in the northwest certainly the first inotrope of choice which is what most pediatric departments and most pediatric nurses are comfortable with drawing is dopamine uh, and we're okay with that um, and it will take a huge culture swing to uh, for us to start reaching out towards adrenaline first uh, which is what the international consensus has said. Uh, I know part of the Midlands and London have already switched uh, have been using adrenaline for quite some time so uh, but ultimately as long as we're getting an anitrope from those three, 
uh, the first line, that's absolutely fine. If you're a purist, um, if you're in warm shop like Chloe, you reach out for NORAD first, then vasopressin. Once you're on the two inotrope mark, you can label your child as inotrope resistant sepsis, so automatically you trigger the need for hydrocortisone. Um, now, most children have a cold shock, uh, and those uh, usually um, start off with adrenaline um, and get some dopamine from the beginning. Again, at the two hundred mark, you need some hydrocortisone, um, and then the transport team will then consider melrinone uh, with some volume, depending whether the child has normal blood pressure or a low blood pressure. Um, personally, I don't use melrinone because they are not convinced by the evidence, but uh, other colleagues think otherwise. So, uh, but that's not the role for the uh, non-intensivists to decide. Uh, as long as you have reached the two anotrope plus steroid mark, you're absolutely flying, um, and you're doing absolutely uh, as much as you can for your patient until your critical care team arrives. Um, but um, don't forget that the child needs a lot of volume uh, so we'll talk a bit about volume now um, uh, and that they're co coagulopathic they're likely to have dilutional anemia and it's imperative that first of all we do no harm now APLS is unfortunately still advocates the use of um, normal saline or abnormal saline as we call it in in, uh, in PICU, um, and that tends to make things worse. Um, it causes uh, hypernatremia, which is an independent risk factor for mortality, as is hyperchloremia, which it can cause. Um, and hyperchloremia causes a, sig a significant um, metabolic acidosis, which then uh, affects um, how well your inotropes are utilized, utilized by your myocardium and so on and so forth. Uh, so most textbooks will say, think about early use of inotrope. So when you've reached the 40 to 60 mL per kilo mark, uh, provided you're not in a resource limited setting. So if you're not in the middle of Africa somewhere and you're practicing in the UK, at 40 to 60 per kilo mark, start thinking about early use of inotropes. Um, best practice would be um, that we try and avoid using uh, saline and we prefer using Hartman's or plasma light so a balanced solution which does not have an, as much chloride to try and keep the uh, uh, acidosis at bay uh, and the best way of giving that is not by telling our uh, junior colleagues to just give a bolus we either watch them give the bolus and watch the screen for response and uh, assess for uh, whether that's improved, uh, lowered the heart rate and improved the blood pressure, or we give it ourselves while watching the screen. So it's an active intervention that we need to keep an eye on. So that's how we need to be, how we need to learn to practice. Uh, but we know with it, these children need lots of volume uh, in excess often of 200 mL per kilo. So we, and they are co coagulopathic. So I'm a big believer in what we call useful volume. So in the context of a child who is cardiovascularly unstable um, and who is actively bleeding, so those two points are important. You need to be unstable and bleeding. Uh, I have a very low threshold for giving blood um, and I have a very low threshold for, collect, uh, for correcting any thrombocytopenias or coagulopathy. So reach out for your useful stuff, your blood to, uh, for a target of 100 grams per deciliter, uh, correct your thrombocytopenia if you're bleeding, give some FFP if they're bleeding, um, and, uh, and that has the added benefit of, at least theoretically, of improving your oxygen carrying capacity. Um, so uh, main learning point from this is don't use saline if you can, use Hardman's or plasma light, if the child is unstable and bleeding, you can you should be correcting the hemoglobin, the, the low th uh, platelets, and uh, the coagulopathy with FFP and platelets, respectively. Um, and then be careful not to overdo it, and 
the only objective way is, is to check for hepatomegaly and for to listen for ronchi, uh, especially if you're not an intensivist or if you don't have a central line to check mix venous sats and all those things. Um, anything else? Any questions so far? There's a question in terms of um, definitions and differentiating between cold and warm shock. It's uh, well, I wouldn't get bogged down by that. If the child feels cold peripherally to touch uh, and hypoperfused, then they have cold shock. If they are vasodilated um, then, and very warm to touch peripherally, then they have warm shock. It really is as simple as that. So we don't need to complicate matters for ourselves by uh, getting bogged down on definitions. Cold is cold and warm is warm. And in relation to fluids, um, would there be any concern about um, hyperkalemia? Because you said to avoid normal saline, um, but with the hypotassium in this patient and others, is there anything specific? Yeah, so, so, that, so that's a great question. So the, the administration of lactate in Hartman's solution can never result in lactic acidosis because it's, Hartman's is a base. Uh, the solution has sodium lactate in it and not lactic acid and sodium lactate does not get metabolized to lactic acid uh, and um, nor does it increase your potassium because Hartman's has four millimoles or per liter of potassium in it um, that's less than the patient's potassium concentration because she's hyperkalemic uh, and therefore if you give something more dilute you can't increase someone's potassium it's as simple as that furthermore Hartmann's because it's an alkali it causes a mild alkalosis uh, which uh, but saline as we know causes an acidosis and that increases a potassium shift from uh, intracellular to extracellular so a number of papers even in anephric patients have shown that even though saline doesn't have potassium in it you get more of a flux hyperkalemia in comparison to either plasma light or Hartman's. So those are common misconceptions, but they are harmful misconceptions. So balanced is best for sick kids. Uh, and I'm hoping ALSG adopt uh, a similar stance uh, they're having yet. And then along, along the um, fluid resuscitation line as well, um, is there a risk of pulmonary hemorrhage that you kind of see uh, practically with giving fluid boluses or anything else that we should be kind of careful of? Yeah, so it's, it's a tight rope. Uh, a lot of fluid it does uh, increase uh, mortality, which is why we need to be, bit, but it's not to say that we shouldn't give it if it's clinically appropriate and if the child is fluid responsive. So, which is why I said, if we monitor for, rails so listening um, for rails uh, and ronchi and uh, feeling for hepatomegaly that's the, the single those are, those are the best markers for the bedside assessment but um, even experienced people can over um, overestimate it sometimes so that is not easy uh, and it takes years of experience to get it right but uh, not giving enough fluid in itself is um, uh, is bad. And so in, sorry, um, so, just in relation to um, the inotropes. Yeah. All patients who get adrenaline also get hydrocortisone, and is it reasonable to avoid um, hydrocortisone or steroids in septic patients, or if you've got high cortisol levels, for example? So, um, in so there's there's a few clues to that. So one is. If the child is already hypoglycemic, that would suggest, and she wasn't, but if the child is hypoglycemic, that would suggest that your adrenals have packed it in already. The, so you've reached your adrenal, the limits of your adrenal response and you can no longer compensate for yourself. That in itself suggests that you need to be thinking about hydrocortisone already. So keep an eye on the sugars because they will give you a clue whether the adrenals are working or not. Um, now, the international consensus shown, has shown that there is uh, moderate level evidence to suggest that once you reach the two anotropes stage, then 
hydrocortisone will be of benefit is likely to be of benefit so uh, yes there's increased risk of suppressing the immune system but despite that the 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 consensus is that we should give it after we've reached the 200 trope mark okay so let's go back to the slides to the uh, polls and i'll show you the correct answer which is the top one well done everyone we've got that one so next would be disability okay so Remember how she presented. Remember that she was fitting, that she banged her head on the pavement and uh, have a think as to what her best chances of um, survival are, where she should go uh, to get the best possible treatment. Good, okay, so there's people voting, there's 40, how many are on the 130? Okay, so a few to go. Okay, so the overwhelming majority so far um, is that we have to neuroprotect, give more for me does, and that she needs a CT even though she's so sick. Um, now, there's a simple reason why she needs a CT, and that is because her only chance of survival is ECMO, really. She is of very high pressures, she's not oxygenating, uh, and she, it's unlikely that even an oscillator um, is, will be able to rectify the situation. Um, now, ECMO is a risky procedure. You've got big lines in your neck uh, or your groin depending on where you go, uh, and you are aggressively um, 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 hemodial, you, you're heparinized essentially. So she's banging her head on the pavement. So no ECMO center would really accept a patient with a recent history of trauma unless we've clarified in advance that there's no intracranial mischief. So we've had to brave it, even though it was hairy, to take her to scan. Um, and thankfully, um, there was no intracranial mischief of any sort. But to do that, uh, we need to be sure that we are neuroprotecting her adequately. So by neuroprotection, I mean doing the simple stuff well. So she's febrile, fever causes a hypermetabolic demand to the brain and makes outcomes in head injury worse. So we need to bring the temperature down aggressively. So anything between 36 and 37 is fine. Uh, sugars were fine. If she was hypoglycemic, we need to aggressively treat that because sugar is food for the brain. Without it, outcomes are worse. Uh, keeping the blood pressure high normal um, is also uh, best. Ventilation was tricky so what the books say is that your pco2 needs to be between 4.5 and 5 kilopascals um, and that's what we tried to do and then she had to be nursed at 30 degree angle to to optimize um, her not getting secondary traumatic brain injury so those are five very simple steps that we can all remember uh, to optimize outcomes in our children who have had a traumatic brain injury um, but putting her through a scary at 30 degrees is a bit tricky, I'll tell you that much. Um, now, morphine and midaz is what we used. So well done, who, those who said that. Uh, it's the standard fallback for uh, keeping our children stable and uh, asleep during transfer. We, in this context, propofol would probably be harmful. Uh, so even though it's quite commonly used in adult anesthesia, kids are much higher risk um, of propofol infusion syndrome, even uh, if given over a short period of time, especially 
if they're hypoperfused, which she was. So propofol infusion sy syndrome causes a, si a significant and resistant lactic acidosis, and we didn't want to uh, exacerbate that. So we steered well clear of the um, white stuff. Uh, so the correct answer is number one. Well done. Any questions on that? There's a little bit of discussion in terms of um, the decision for CT head potentially changing if you're in a district general hospital. Uh, so, we, so we were in a DGH. Service. So we were in DGH and that was a problem. We had to get the radiologist out of hours to come from home to facilitate this. But this was a, uh, so, but it had to be done by us in a DGH. So this, remember, this is a presentation about how a DGH can prepare um, with, uh, with a helping hand, of course, for uh, until the critical care team arrives. So all this was done at the DGH, um, either before or after we arrived. Uh, so all this was needed. So we cannot, uh, there's a handful of ECMO centers in the UK. So if she needs ECMO to survive, then we may need to transfer her over a longer period, which adds to the transfer risks. So it's best that we know whether she's eligible for ECMO or not, because if she had not been eligible for ECMO due to the intracranial mischief, A, she might have had to go to a different centre, a neurosurgical centre, um, because often, but occasionally they don't overlap, or she might have gone to a general PIC without ECMO backup. And that's why it needed to be done at the DGH. Um, anything else? Um, nothing significant, just a, a couple of um, questions. Again, um, comment about uh, whether we've gone quite quickly down the sepsis route and whether there could have been a significant head injury behind all of this uh, along the way. And also um, how much a CT head would change, um, how time critical the transfer would be um, and potentially the place they were going. So I think you've touched on that. Um, already, but whether it would swing between ECMO and the and yeah, so the so it, it it was a difficult decision, but I stand by it because I can tell you she was um, on on the way to a different ICU, which didn't provide ECMO. Uh, she would have been on the way to that ICU had it not been for the CT to okay here for ECMO. So, and if she had gone to a general PICU it is highly unlikely that she will have survived this. Uh, now, I agree that we didn't touch upon the head injury management um, during the presentation, but throughout the sepsis management part, we were doing all those neuroprotective measures, and indeed, we had an even lower threshold for resuscitating with blood product, um, which we did anyway for the sepsis. So there was significant overlap between ma managing two separate life-threatening pathologies. Uh, she was just fortunate that she didn't have a significant intracranial bleed or anything like that. Um, okay, so uh, I'm cognizant it's already nine o'clock, so let's move on. Final question. So this is the easy part. So remember, she went to the GP with a sore throat and a high fever. So what is the likeliest pathology if people could type in what they think might be the problem um, and what would you choose
Okay, so about half of you have answered, so crack on. So, um, we've got so, quite a few comments um, okay, go mentioning on. group A stress and toxic shock syndrome, okay. uh, and potentially comments on things that that people might add, such as acyclovir um, and further broad spectrum. Good, excellent. Okay, so um, excellent. Um, so great. So we she had a sore throat. So on balance, this is probably toxin producing group A strep, which can also be toxic shock. Um, and in that context, um, a high dose cephalosporin, and I don't mind what, what you use, cefotaxim or, ket or keftriaxone, whichever your trust recommends, uh, is correct, and as long as it's the high dose. Uh, but if we're suspecting toxin producing substance, and in warm shock, it's, um, it's hard not to think about toxin producing substance um, bacteria uh, then we need to make sure we give something that will stop toxin production and something that will not pop toxin toxins um, so at the very least clindamycin should be added if we're suspecting group A strep uh, which because uh, clindamycin has the capacity to stop the toxins being produced even if you give a low dose clinda it will do that based on evidence. I'm not saying give low dose clinda, give a proper dose, but uh, it's a very good adjunct to uh, as, a, as a synergistic antibiotic to cephalosporin, um, which then bring us to IVIG, which Chloe did get, um, and it's a battle to get IVIG, and stocks internationally are very low, uh, but we have had to use it because um, she fits a very small percentage of children with sepsis whereby we thought that IVIG would be helpful and, and the big Cochrane review there's contradicting evidence about use of IVIG in sepsis generically but there's better quality evidence to suggest that it may be useful as an adjunct in in toxic shock or in toxin producing uh, substances or in pathologies such as necrotizing fasciitis and stuff like that um, because it can mop up your toxins. Uh, now you have to convince the gatekeepers of the very expensive IVIG to release it and it takes a bit of paperwork but we were blessed by very um, tenacious pediatricians uh, in the DGH that managed to get it for us very quickly and I think that it had a significant out, um, influence on the outcome. Um, now, does anyone in the panel know what we could use if we did not have IVIG um, instead, of, um, instead of IVIG? Brownie points, you can name them and get pat them on the back. FFP has been mentioned a couple of Yeah, times. well done. So FFP has low dose immunoglobulin and uh, my teachers, who are much older than me, uh, have been using that in the past uh, before they had the pure version of IVIG. So uh, if you can't get it, FFP has low dose immunoglobulin in it and it's useful trick up your sleeve to think about uh, in cases of toxic shock or toxin producing organisms if they're unstable and septic and that's your correct answer uh, i um the acyclovir i agree we uh, she did get it when she got to the um uh, to the picu but we didn't give it p4 transport uh, we didn't think it was this was behaving like an invasive virus um i don't know whether that was right or wrong but um that's what we did uh, any questions before we uh, show you the management plan it's in its entirety? No questions coming up, Costas, so carry on. Okay, so, and that's what we did. Uh, so we put on a cuffed T tube, we gave some nebulized tranexamic acid and adrenaline, we used the high PEEP strategy, uh, we tried up PEEPs up to 16 uh, and then ended up hand ventilating it onto ECMO. We had quite a long eye time. We avoided nitric to avoid uh, getting a pulmonary bleed. Uh, we had early recognition that ECMO was her only chance of survival. 
She was on every anatrope under the sun, so she was already on dopamine when we got there, and we had norad, vasopressin, then adrenaline and steroids, and had lots of calcium. Uh, she didn't need calcium chloride, we just stayed with uh, gluconate. We did a CT head, there was a bit of a wobble in CT where we were thinking uh, that she might be uh, coning, so she had a bit of 3% cell line to help neuroprotect a bit more. Thankfully, the CT was normal and she was on morphine and midaz. We just talked about antibiotics and that's all the fluid she had. Um, and so that's a combination of fluid given to her by the DGH and by us when we got there. So she had 260 per kilo in total, combination of blood, FFP, platelets, uh, abnormal cell line and plasma line. And she spent a week on ECMO. She was decannulated from ECMO on Boxing Day. Um, and this is her on her eighth birthday, two years on, riding a unicorn uh, after considerable neuro rehab. So, uh, and she's still needing uh, some support with neuro rehab, but she she's exceeded um, all expectations, largely because not because of the critical care transport team, but largely because of the DGH uh, bending over backwards and doing everything to help us uh, and do everything by the book. Which then brings me to uh, the last and perhaps most important lesson from all this. Uh, so that's Chloe's mom in the background. She's the one who consented for us to use her case for learning. Um, now, if you imagine, you know, when we went home, we all felt that we had a terrible day at the office and we were drained. And can you just imagine what uh, Chloe's mum and dad were feeling? Um, so the whole world was collapsing before their eyes. Uh, so make sure that when you have a child that's sick, you delegate that someone you trust in the team it doesn't have to be a doctor it can be a, a a good nurse a good paramedic who knows uh what's going on uh goes and touches base with them every 15 minutes updates them explain what's happening at every step of the way um and just be kind and humane and treat them as you would like to be treated if touch wood your own child was in this mess because uh, i promise you you know, Chloe's mum did not remember whether we used NORAD first or dopamine first, but she remembered that we took the time to give her a glass of water and keep her uh, in the loop about how sick she was and what the management was. So make sure you do that. Um, and these are some uh, references. So the first one is what I based my practice on so that's from this year the consensus it's a long document but worth going through there's also a more succinct version it's open access if you click on the link or type in the link crashcall.net is uh the newt's uh um automatic calculator which you can print and use as a, a prescribing sheet it automatically prescribes it for you if you put the weight in i'm sure your own regions uh, will have their own but that's the one i use and uh if you want a shorter version of this talk uh, uh it's available as a podcast on the don't forget the bubbles website which um is a talk a similar talk again on chloe i did uh earlier this year and it's only 20 minutes long so if you want to uh, consolidate things have a listen and uh, if you have any questions you can tweet uh, at me at um, and that's my uh, Handle. Um, any last questions before we call it a night? There's one question about the role of bicarbonate, um, particularly with the acidosis. Mm. Um, yeah, so um, that's, a, that's a good question. Um, uh, and I think she, she did get some bicarb. I uh, just chose what to uh, specifically talk about. Now, um, it's a balance. So if your pH is less than seven, I, I would tend to at least try and give, uh, correct the pH to above seven. The rationale being that, like I said before, the myocardium does not work very well at extreme acidosis conditions, nor do the well work very well if your pH is less than seven. 
So to optimize all that, we need to try and correct that. You need to balance that against the risk of pushing the sodium too high. Uh, but uh, more often than not, I would give bicarb until the pH is above seven. Um, do try and optimize things. And then one more question, just going back to something that was mentioned quite early on in the talk, um, giving further anti-epileptics um, once you've kind of got to that point of already giving um, Kepra, at what point would you think about that again um, and what kind of timescales would you use? Yeah, so don't forget she's on morphine and midaz. Um, and um, so the midazolam would be taken care of her seizure control because it's going in as a continuous infusion. So it's very rare that we need to give something extra. If she's already had Kepra or Phenytoin, that's long acting enough uh, usually. Um, if she was aseptic, I wouldn't give Thio. Don't forget she's had a bit of ketamine for induction. So ketamine is also uh, got anti-epileptic properties. Uh, so a combination of everything she had before plus one of ketamine plus uh, continuous midazolam infusion should be enough to stop most seizures but then this brings us back to not giving atropine and giving dilute adrenaline instead because one of the best ways of monitoring for seizures is keeping an eye on the pupils if you dilated the pupils artificially using atropine to push the heart rate up during induction then you've blunted that diagnostic skill uh, until at least you go to PRCU and you can monitor her using uh, CFAM or whatever. So try and steer away from atropine and go towards dilute adrenaline if you can, just for that very reason. Um, not just for that reason, but one of, that's one of the main reasons. No, I think that's great. We're just getting lots of um, positive feedback and lots of thank yous in the chat now. So. Um, I think we can probably come to a close. Thank you very much, Costas. No, you're welcome. Okay, so we're gonna to come to a close now. I'm just gonna share some of the slides so that you can um, find the link to the recorded versions of um, the full set of webinars. There's a number now with lots of different topics and subjects. Um, over a number of specialties. So you can find those um, on the link, which I'll put up in a moment um, and has been posted in the chat at some point tonight, I would hope. There we go, thank you very much, Anne. Um, so feel free to have a look at those and see if any of those are useful to watch. The recording of this session will um, be available at that link in um, around about a week's time, just once we've had time to edit and upload it. So thank you very much for all of your attendance. I'll put up some slides now, but feel free to log off. There is a feedback form as you close the window. So please fill that in for both of our speakers so that we can um, give them some thanks for um, planning the sessions and for delivering them. That's great. So thank you very much. So again, you can find the full program of events on HEE and there's the link to the recorded webinars, which are also in the chat. If you can start to log off now so that the panel can have a chat about further sessions, that would be great. Thank you very much for attending. <laughs>